So this is from the other day. This is NPR.org. Key takeaways from France's election round one, where the far right prevails. Yeah, there was rioting, like crazy rioting from Islamists and leftists because French people who want their nation, they believe in the French national identity are starting to take back their country. They're they're no longer just going to let it be given away. Mm -hmm. The big problem outside of all of this, fertility, outside of all the politics of it is fertility. French people aren't having enough kids. People in the United States aren't having enough kids. That's the issue. And regardless of what you do, if you want to maintain your, your country, your national identity, you got to babies. Yeah. yeah. You have to have someone to pass down your unique cultural traditions to, right? But, but there, would, there, would, there would be another way. Like, look, there are ways to incentivize people to have children rather than just, you know, shipping people in. I mean, it's costing a lot more to, and, and, to support these new people that are coming in than to financially support people to have babies if that's the route you want to go. Can, can I just I just want to I want to read this. Uh, the results from the first round Sunday were national rally earned thirty three point one five. The new popular front alliance of center left socialists, greens and far left, twenty eight point one four and Emmanuel Macron centrist, twenty point seven six. Voter turnout was high at fifty nine point three nine. Look, mm. we are seeing hyperpolarization across the board. These are terrifying numbers. The fa- like the polarization in France is not going to lead to good things. People who are French and love France and want to see it restored to to the beauty of the you know of of what it was under this this ideal French culture, they are up against people who are not citizens and far leftists who want to see the West torn down. Right. What do you think the end result is going to be? They're already rioting. Yeah. Well, we, we already knew at this point that and everybody sort of predicted that. I don't know if you saw the videos and such of of them boarding up windows in Paris before the results even came out. So we already knew that. But how far are they going to take something like that? How far are they going to go? And, you know, what, what do we have to be worried about beyond that? Because, you know, if, if the people are waking up and they're finally like, I'm surprised by this result. I haven't been following this very closely, but, you know, I don't think anybody really expected Europe to finally wake up. I'm hoping that we see that. In the U.S. as well, uh, but you know, go to places in in southern France and stuff where the crime rate is through the roof. All the locals have been driven out, and I don't know how. What do you do besides mass deportations to fix that stuff at this point? I think she's talking about arrests too, like like imprisonment for people, uh, stripping people of their actual citizenship if they adopt Islamist radical Islamist ideals. Ooh. I'm not exactly. It's kind of vague, it's kind of based, and, and some vague rhetoric. I'm not sure exactly how or what, but people are. Be, obviously, the 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 majority, I, or I don't know if the majority is the right word, but the plurality is that the right word? The thirty some percent, the most of any of them, seem to support this this rhetoric. And it's been on the rise. I mean, and you're seeing this with the double. Like you mentioned, uh, that you can incentivize people to have children. And you sure. see this, especially in Eastern Europe. There are a couple different countries that will say, you know, I think Hungary is one of them where they're saying mm-hmm. you don't have to pay um, uh, income tax if you have a certain number of yep. children. And, you know, I might get income. But it's, there's a couple of them that are doing this because they say we believe in helping our people have their own family rather than saying, hey, it's OK if if our, our native born population goes away because we'll just bring in whoever, you know, happens to want to come across the border. Uh, and I think. This is sort of reflective of the conversation that's happening in France. Like NPR was reporting on this. And one of the things they pointed out was, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of especially young men who are saying, I, I, I feel like France doesn't have a place for me more. And they feel like this is my country and I should be treated differently than I am right now, where I'm told that, you know, I'm lowest priority. And so one of the policies that they're talking about is that, uh, you know, social safety nets, any sort of social programming should be open to French citizens first over immigrants. And I I feel like that is so basic. The fact that it's an extreme idea is upsetting. You know, it is one thing if you're a country that says we want to offer aid or we want to be compassionate, you know, you don't want to treat people who are different than you badly. On the other hand, like, if you're a taxpayer and you pay into a social program that's supposed to benefit you, the idea that someone who is not paying into it, it takes priority over you is obviously offensive. And it's the most Christian thing is to take care of yourself before you try to take care of someone else. Take the plank out of your own eye before you try and take the speck of dust out of your neighbor's eye, or your brother's eye, or whatever. Put your own air mask on before you try and secure the mask of the person next to you. You have to protect the citizens of the country. That is primary motive number one. You... you support your citizens, and then you'll be able to handle an influx. That's the only way. When did this become controversial, though? Why are we even having to argue about whether or not that should be the top priority of the I, country? I think it was it, it is a reaction to Trump. I think that's what it was because he was kind of saying those things. Well, he wasn't articulating it like that. People were like, Trump bad, anything Trump says yep. bad. 
reverse. And like, what? No, that doesn't mean let everybody in in any in any capacity. But it could have also it could also happen in cycles. I don't know. I think it's been happening for a long time, right? But it just I think- accelerated. I mean, so quickly though. It's almost like it seems like you know overnight almost. I think it was when they said come when um biden and harris were like you can come here they they said something publicly like real early on in his administration i thought it was kamala saying don't, don't come later she was like don't <laughs> come i'm like, gonna come. come no never mind yeah, yeah. after I'm, she realized like, come. oh god what have we unleashed <laughs> so biden like kind of urged people to come to the states it was early on i don't remember i wish i could find the quote or pull off the quote off the top of my head and then after that there was just a surge and then kamala came out and was like don't come don't we made a mistake. She didn't go that far. She just said, don't. Stop, please. <laughs> but, no. but, so what's a little bit worrying, and I, I won't say too much more about this, but like, what, what, what worries me about these numbers is you still have the majority of people, you know, because only 33 percent are, are the ones that are kind of rebuking these policies. Do not the, come. The other, oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Give it to me, Kamala. Do not come. She's serious. I'm going to come. I'm going to come. <laughs> <laughs> that was the meme. So you were saying so 70, 67 percent of the people are not for uh, this? apparently they still support what's going on over there because they didn't vote against those policies. They are voting in favor of the BS that's going on in Europe and, and France in particular right now. I think a lot of it comes from ignorance, too, because if you don't know how dangerous it is to allow foreigners in mass into your country in an yeah. unmitigated migration, then you you might just be like, we got to help everybody. Right. And so it's like this form of ignorance. In a, in a the, way. The, the challenge is it's always low IQ people and disinterested people versus passionate people and higher IQ people. And this is why I think we need to restrict voting. No question. Mm. The voting restriction should be something reasonable and easy, but I believe- Landowners? No, it's too difficult. Uh, Landowners made sense when we had small uh, communities and people were mostly like farming. But then we got to the, with industrialization and offices, people now rent apartments. They don't intend to own something. They want to move somewhere later. There's a lot, you know- this is frowned upon by the left almost all the time, but there is a reason to rent. You're younger, you want to live in the city for a little bit, and then you don't want to spend a lot of money, you don't want to put in a big down payment, you want to work a job, move up, save money, and then get a down payment, buy a house in the suburbs, to have a family, these things can make sense. But I think we need some kind of minor hurdle that keeps out disinterested people. Vivek talks about civics tests, like a high school civics test. I think selective service is the perfect option. In order to vote, you sign up for selective service, And in response, they mail you your voter card. Your Mm. voter card entitles you to vote. Don't have it, you don't vote. Signing up for Selective Service is completely optional for men and women. If you want to vote, you must sign up and then you get your voter card. You have skin in the game. And it's the we haven't had a draft in 50 some odd years. And I don't expect there to be one. But if you want to say in how we have wars and who gets gets sent to war, right now, understand this. Men are forced to sign up for Selective Service and women overwhelmingly are voting for war. I'm not okay with that. With the, all, these women are voting Democrat and heavily, and they're voting for war to send to put men in harm's way. It's not equality. If the men want to choose to fight and die for their country and the people they believe in, so be it. But hold on. That would mean the men who are forced to fight and die in wars would have a say in whether or not we do. So I think selective service makes a lot of sense. Um, and that would instantly remove all low information and disinterested voters. Democrats would no longer be able to do these big voter drives where they'd go to rock concerts and say, sign up to vote. They're going to be like, if I fill that out, you're saying I could get drafted. Screw that. I'm not doing that. And then it's like, OK. And then guess what? All the low information, low IQ, disinterested voters are gone. And what happens to your country? It blossoms. No, I think that's a really interesting idea. And that's the first time I've ever hearing this, actually. So that's. That, that, that's awesome. But, you know, you're talking about Vivek. I, I haven't heard what Vivek was saying, but you're saying a civics. Yeah, test high school civics. Test. So a, a year and a half ago, Vivek uh, came on the cultural podcast and that was his idea that he said he was thinking about, but he wasn't sure if it's what he wants to do. And then later said he's moved away from that and he's considered some kind of civics test. Oh, really? Well, see, the, the, the problem with something, the only problem with something like that that I can think of right off the bat is what, the, what's the left going to do? They're going to attack that as racist. They're going to say it's, it's just a literacy test yeah. all over again. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I think that selective service makes more sense because yeah. you don't need to be smart to join the selective service. Right. You just need to be willing to serve the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so therefore you get a say in where the country goes mm-hmm. and what the country does. Yep. Or who's going to decide for you? Who's going to be your commander? You get to decide because you're, you're you're part of the game. Do you think we have young people who want to serve the country? I mean, 
some of this comes down to patriotism, right? Someone who was like, yeah, I, I want to have skin in the game and I believe in this country and want to participate. They would be like, yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll take civics tests or I'll, I'll sign up for whatever. Uh, it's people who don't like America, but also want to say in what's going on, who would have an objection to it, in my opinion. I think there's a lot of people that want to serve the country. A lot of people that are terrified of getting shipped off overseas for some, like Vietnam all over again, a draft to go send people to a meat grinder. But even if it's not military service, right? Like volunteering, running for office, you know, do, working, uh, you know, in public schools so that you can help, you know, other American citizens get a good education, things like that. Their service doesn't have to be military, hypothetically. Yeah. And it'd be a lot better than just complaining online. Like, I know a lot of people that just post online. Well, hey, and that's what I kind of what I do for a living. I know. But, you'd be, but the be people that aren't it. making money doing it, that are just doing it and <laughs> going to a job they hate and then complaining yeah, yeah. out of fear. Like, it's one thing, like, complaining because there's a problem and, like, suggesting solutions. That's a different story. But the people that are just, like, bad, bad, bad mm -hmm. thing, bad thing. Like, you can serve in other ways. Maybe that even feels like they're doing their, their duty, but it's not. I think that we need more, do, more service. Um, but, I mean, wh how would you define it exactly? Oh, I just think service can be, you know, it could be military and that's great, but it also could be civil, right? Like you could, uh, I don't remember which president had one of these programs where you like go build roads. I mean, there are things FDR? you could do. Yeah, FDR. Uh, you could do things for in service of your country that don't have to be necessarily deploy, don't have to be deploying. I know typically when we say you serve the country, we mean military. And again, no problem if that's the way you want to do it. But I think uh, the question comes down to, do we have young people who feel as though they want to make a difference in their nation or community? Yeah. I think so many of them don't, they, they want to talk about America as though it's something that's happening over there without realizing that they could actively be a part of it. Yeah, if you're doing it right, I think a lot of people are excited because if we, we do need a reinvestiture in our infrastructure, we need another industrialization, another de new, what, like the New Deal, not that this goofy thing called the Green New Deal. I'm talking right. about a complete revamp of our roads using graphene, putting them in so they last three times longer, new buildings, new houses, new rails so that the railways don't get warped. Like we could send 30 million people to work on taxpayer dollars. We'd have to print a lot of money, well, but we might end up making money in the process. The problem is, if we do that, who's going to fund blowing up children overseas? Mm, the mm. British. And the 800 military bases we were just talking about. I mean... Yeah, it's, 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 look, you know, sure, we could fix our roads and fix the plumbing and build uh, uh, new housing and schools and libraries, but uh, there are Russians in Ukraine that I just plum don't like. I mean... You, Russia and us and um, Alaska are like, I don't know, 100 miles away from each other. So like an invasion from the north, we would need strong rails to get from the east coast to the west coast in, in six hours. We need high speed rails to get our troops across the country just for national defense. I, That's I, why I we build the highways. I to write to Pete yeah. Buttigieg, uh, who's really managing all of this <laughs> super well. And from the south to the north, too. Like, I'd be open to building a high-speed rail from Especially Los the, Angeles to the, Alaska. Why can't Crash we and spill chemicals that? everywhere. That'd be great. We can. Oh, jeez. I... The East Palestine thing. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I confronted him there in East Palestine, Ohio. Pete Buttigieg, we're talking about, and and you know, I, I asked him like specifically, uh, you know, why do you keep blaming Trump for all your failures? You've been in office for years now. Why do you keep blaming Trump for that? And it, because it's he doesn't actually do anything. He's not capable of doing anything either. You've got, uh, but but the the Democrats have been trying to build that high speed rail out in California for the longest time. It goes to nowhere. Who wants to go from Bakersfield to Modesto, California? You know, it costs ten billion dollars already and they haven't done anything so the question is you know because you're talking about okay we need to improve our infrastructure and build new rail and stuff we, are we even capable of doing that anymore where did we go wrong why are we so bad at this now well there's like a it's um, not the money an, no it's more of an ignorance problem because i don't i think people don't understand the materials that we would we would use new materials like graphene instead of iron you know for our for our railways we'd have like really lightweight strong rails that would last us 60 years and wouldn't warp but once people figure out how, then they get excited and they, they realize they can. It's just a matter of, I guess, education about how to do it and then incentivizing people to actually do it by using taxpayer dollars or by subsidizing the private sector and getting industry to go ahead and start building. I'd love to see that high-speed rail out of California finish. I don't know what much about it, to be honest. Do you? Uh, nope. uh, well, I, I think it's, a, um, it's a, a total crap show, and it always has been. It, it, it's how many tens of billions of dollars over budget at this point? They haven't done any. I think that what they've completed so far was an overpass. Uh, that's, that's what I read anyway. That's the only part of the... 
uh, of the the new span that's been built in the past ten years or something. Just something crazy. It's almost like it's almost a joke at this point. To, we've got Gavin Newsom even backing off of it, and you know well, being, he's preparing to run for president. Yeah, so he can't uh, be associated he, with failed. Exactly, projects. exactly. We could model off of these foreign countries that are building them. I think Japan has one now, maybe. And look also, at China's look at China's high speed rail network. It's incredible. They're ready for war. They're preparing for war. They're preparing to ship their troops across the country in a matter of hours. I don't think they're shipping them. I think they're just coming across the southern border. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. They're... I'm not. I'm like. I wish I was being totally hyperbolic, but again, you see that like this stereotype of it's like, oh, people from Mexico are crossing the southern border. Yes, that does happen, but the majority of people are not. They're they're from other South American countries or even China. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you that they're like? Hey, I, I think I know how to get in there. But why is nobody answering the question as to how they're getting there? How are these these massive groups of military age Chinese men getting into Southern California? Because that's where they're all that's where they're all going now. Yeah. Big groups of them. They're and starting. The South China, you're telling me the Chinese don't know this. The Chinese government tracks every single movement in that country. They know how these people are getting there. I think they're coming through this, the Darien Gap in Panama. Well, no, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying they're leaving China. And the Chinese government knows that they're that they're coming over here. It's like, but how much of a hand do they have in it? It seems like they would have to have some sort of a hand to get thousands and thousands of Chinese people, you know, into the United States. Yeah, if no. they didn't, they'd be contacting our government and be like, give us our people back. There's people over there. Yeah. We want them. Right. Don't let them be there. Like, that's obvious. It seems exactly. pretty obvious they want them here. Yep. Thanks for checking out this clip from TimCast IRL. Make sure to watch the show live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. Subscribe to this channel and we will see you all there.